Welcome to my series of videos on uh, mathematics for economists. In this video, I would like to talk about vectors, matrices, vector spaces, linear independence, and the dimension of vector spaces. So let's start with the, with the concept of vectors. Um, so we can, for example, consider two vectors, um, one given by the entries 3, 1, and another one, let's call them v1 and v2, given by the entries 1 and 2. Uh, if we now go ahead and draw these vectors in this uh, Cartesian coordinate system, so 3 is the, uh, is the x-coordinate and uh, 1 is the y-coordinate, then I just draw a line from the origin to the point 3, 1. And if I'm so inclined, put a little arrowhead on uh, the end, and uh, this is going to be my vector v1. And in the same fashion, I can draw the vector 1 and 2 by drawing a line from the origin to the point 1 and 2 in the coordinate system. And I have my two vectors in the plane here. Uh, two entries, two dimensional objects. Uh, I can draw them as lines in the plane. Then I can consider simple operations such as the sum of the two vectors. And the sum is defined as the element wise sum. So I uh, add 3 to 1, gives 4, and I add 1 to 2 in the y coordinate, this gives 3. And then I can draw the sum of these two vectors in the same fashion uh, at the point 4 and 3. So I draw a line again from the origin to the point 4 and 3. And this is going to be my vector v1 plus v2. I didn't write v2 here. Um, yeah, and then you can observe that uh, sum of the two vectors v1 and v2 is in a sense the diagonal of the parallelogram that is spanned by the two vectors v1 and v2. And this geometric observation expresses the fact that uh, it doesn't really matter whether you say uh, I'm adding v2 to v1, as here, which means that geometrically you go first in the direction of v1 and then you go in the direction of v2 and you reach this point. Or that you add v2, sorry, add v1 to v2, let's put it that way, which of course gives the same result, and that means that you first go in the direction of v1, v2, and then you go in the direction of v1, and of course you reach the same point. So this, uh, this commutativity of the addition of vectors is the geometric observation that uh, you end up with a diagonal uh, of the parallelogram that is spanned by these two vectors. Okay. Um, of course, we can also consider the uh, uh, the difference. So, if we are to compute uh, v one minus v two, then we get uh, again element wise three minus one that would be two, and one minus two that would be minus one, and we can draw this in the same fashion. Well, I haven't really given a, a minus 1 here, but that's easily fixed, so minus 1, there it is. Um, so I draw a line from the origin to the point minus 2 and 1, which is roughly here. And so this is v1 minus v2. Yeah. Now, of course, I can also 
uh, consider multiples of vectors. So for example, I can multiply the vector v2 by 2. Uh, 2 times v2. Now again, element-wise, this is 2 times 1 would be 2, and 2 times 2 would be 4. And if I draw this vector, I get uh, so the point 2 and 4, and I'm just going to draw a dot there so that I know where to hit. Um, then I get, as you can see, essentially just an extension. Well, this is up to uh, up to the accuracy of this tool and my, my drawing art here. Uh, I just get an extension of the vector v2, uh, and I'm, I'm doubling the length. In So this will be 2 times v2. In the same fashion, I can, of course, also consider 1 half times v2, um, which would be uh, 1 half and 1, 1 half and 1. And um, a drawing this, uh, one half and one. You see, this is a, this is a, a shrinkage of the oops, a shrinkage of the vector v two to half the length. So this would be one half v two. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you see that uh, uh, addition, subtraction, and um, Multiplication with scalars are, are all possible, and here we've been, of course, uh, always in the in the two-dimensional space, which uh, is the the Cartesian project product of two lines, uh, often denoted by R two, because we think of both lines as uh, uh, visualizing the the set of real numbers. Okay, so far so good. Of course, we can also consider the three-dimensional case. And in order to save some time, I have already prepared my drawings here. So now we have a three-dimensional space, and we want to consider uh, a number of vectors. So uh, uh, let's, uh, uh, let, me, let me write them here underneath. Um, so I have a vector v1, say. Um, this is now an object in three-dimensional space, so I need three coordinates. Let's say those are 1, 2, and 3. Um, I have a second vector, v2. Let's say this is 3, 1, and 2. And I have a third vector. Well, no, let's just start with uh, let's just start with 2 here. Then um, I'm going to consider uh, uh, addition and subtraction here, but let's just first draw these vectors. Uh, how do I do this now? Um, so first I go into the x coordinate. Yeah? So that would be that would be as before x, y, and commonly the third coordinate is, is labeled z. Uh, so this is how I labeled the axis. So I just have to um, just have to draw have to find the point one, two, and three in three dimensional dimensional space, and I do this here. Oops, have to uh, try to do this somewhat carefully that it doesn't get too much of a mess in the end. Um, I do this here. This is one and two in x y in the x y plane, and now I need to go up three units into the into the z direction. I can do it like this, and this gives me roughly this point. So I draw a line from the origin to this point. Yeah, it's not so good Want to hit the origin a bit better. So, yeah, well, it's good enough. Um, this is going to be my vector v1. And now in the same fashion, I draw v2. I have to find 3, 1, and 2. So first 3, and I just need to go 
one unit into the y direction. This is the y direction, and now uh, two units upwards in the in the in the z direction. And I have this would be this would be two units, which you can see if you go the one unit in the forty five degrees here. And then move over three units in the x direction. Now it's this point, and I draw a line from the origin to whoops from the origin to this point. Can make it clear. So it does not want to cooperate. That's why. So, and this would be V two. So now I have drawn these two vectors into three-dimensional space and, and of course I can think about uh, what is the sum of these two guys v1 plus v2 again uh, this is element wise so um, 1 plus 3 so of course 4 2 plus 1 so of course 3 and 3 plus 2 5 this would be the sum. So now I need to draw 4, 3, and 5 into x, y, and z space. So again, start at 4, um, 3 units into the, into the y direction, 2 units a little bit messy for me. Three units somewhere here, and five units northward into the into the z direction. One, two, three. Now I draw the connecting line from the origin to this point. V1 plus V2. And again, you can see that this is supposed to be three-dimensional, so it's a, uh, it's, it's bit harder to see but I draw this freehandedly here so uh, you see that again the sum is uh, this is not going to go well the sum is somewhat of the not somewhat it is the diagonal of a parallelogram only that this parallelogram now you have to imagine as being uh, a bit tilted into the three-dimensional space yeah um, but so the the same principle applies as in two dimensions and then of course I can also uh, consider the, the the difference of the two would be 1 minus v2. This would be um, 1 minus 3, that would be minus 2. Um, 2 minus 1, that's 1. And 3 minus 2 is also 1. And then I can, by the same token, draw minus 2 and 1 minus 2 and no, one unit in the y direction and one unit in the z direction and I draw the line from the origin to this point 
and this will be v1 minus v2. Okay, so here you see that we have the same uh, geometric intuition, so to speak, in uh, two and three dimensions. Of course, we can easily uh, generalize these uh, operations to four and five dimensions, only that uh, the geometric intuition then is gone, but the, the rules remain the same. All right, so now let us start with something that is at first pass looking quite differently. Um, this is my attempt at drawing the unit circle, so please uh, please excuse if this doesn't quite look like a circle. This is what it's supposed to represent, so your mind can easily do uh, what my hand and this tool cannot. Um, in the unit circle, you may remember why well, I drew uh, x and y here, but let me uh, let me erase this. This is actually not what I want to say. Um, I want to say rather uh, the cosine of theta and the sine of theta. In the unit circle, um, you will remember that if we consider a, an angle here from the origin, and let me use the 45 degree angle for convenience, and let me call this angle theta. Um, if we consider such an angle, we can express these these angles in in, uh, in radians. So, so this would be forty five degrees uh, in in degree notation, and in radians, this is uh, uh, this is p quarter p quarter. Um, because, uh, as you remember, the uh, the circumference of a uh, of a circle is uh, um, two times the uh, the diameter, and the diameter of the unit circle is, is pi. So the entire circumference is two times pi, and so uh, half the circumference uh, up to here is pi. Of the entire circumference would be two pi, and so. The quarter of the circumference, therefore, is pi half, and uh, this would be an eighth of the circumference is pi quarter. That's why we can express this angle theta as uh, pi quarter. Okay. Um, now I can think of these points that are kind of implied. Uh, in, in, in what I'm talking about here, um, as vectors, of course. So, so I can denote, let me call this vector v1 here, and this vector v2. If you want, you can now draw some arrows, but that's not material. Um, I can call v1, uh, well, what do I call it? The, the, the x coordinate is 1, and the, the y coordinate is 0. And well, what would be v2? Here I appeal to uh, your your recollection of Pythagoras, um, and I draw a triangle. Then we can see right away that this, of course, is a right angle, and so Pythagoras applies. And I know that the length of the of what is now the hypotenuse in this language, that this length is one. And of course, then the, the square I do this kind of symbolically, yeah? don't don't hold me accountable for the lengths of the sides here actually being equal to 1. This is supposed to be square. Um, so the square of 1, 1 times 1, of course, is also still 1. And um, and then uh, let me remove these again so that uh, 
Yeah, but this is not uh, a digital here. Um, the square is also one, uh, and and then I have uh, good old Pythagoras saying that that a square plus b square is c square. Uh, c square is one, and now I observe that uh, since I have uh, equal sides, that a is equal to b, and therefore uh, a square plus b square is a square plus a square, or 2a square. I'm not sure why this 2 is automatically erasing the last little bit. Um, equal to 1, which means that a square is equal to 1 half, which means that a is equal to 1 over square root of 2. And here I'm running out of space. So I'm uh, Side. Uh, a square is equal to one half, and so uh, a is equal to taking the square roots on both sides, one over square root of two. And I note here, even though it seems silly at the moment, I note that the one over the square root of two is uh, the square root of two divided by two. No, it's the same thing. All right. So I know, therefore, that. So first off, since these sides are the same, I can also call this A, and again, it's erasing things on me. Um, I can also call this A, and I know now that A is square root of 2 half. All right. Um, so what does this mean? This means that V2, my, my vector here, uh, which has coordinates also here, square root of 2 half, which has the, these two same coordinates is given as square root of 2 half, square root of 2 half. Okay, so far so good. Um, now let's, let's look at a, at a different vector. Let's look at the vector that is given as um, what do I want to call it? Um, well, let's call it let's call it v two tilde. Let's look at the vector v two tilde, which is given uh, by the entries one and one. All right, that's easy enough. That would be this point here. So this is an extension of the vector v2, which is the reason why I call it v2 tilde, um, to the point 1 and 1. OK, how do I arrive? Can I think of a transformation that takes my vector v1, 1 and 0, and turns it into the vector v2, square root of 2 half and square root of 2 half. And can I think of a transformation that takes my vector v2 and turns it into v2 tilde? Actually, the last part here we already know from uh, uh, what we discussed on the, on the last sheet. Um, all I need to do here, of course, is to um, uh, in order to go from v2 to uh, v2 tilde, all I need to do is multiply by square root of 2, right? Because then I multiply element-wise. Square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2, and I get in each element 2 over 2, which is 1. So this is just stretching, and here you see it also geometrically. Uh, this is just stretching the vector v2, which here has, has length 1, which... Um, Sometimes we denote this uh, as uh, with uh, with double bars, uh, which has length one here, to a vector which which now what's the length of of v two tilde here? I haven't written this in v two tilde. Now I need to draw again, so please excuse. Oops. 
something like this. Yeah. So the question is, um, uh, what's the length of this vector? Well, again, let's, uh, uh, let's ask Pythagoras. Of course, here we have again, um, we have again a right angle. The lengths of the sides are each one. Yeah, and so Pythagoras says that the square of this side, which is the square of one, which is again one, plus the square of this side, which is one, so again one, is equal to the square of the hypotenuse, which would be the length of our vector v2 tilde. Um, this is uh, uh, this is our what do I want to call it? The length of the length of v2 squared. And so um, well, this is this is of course one plus one, so this is two, and therefore therefore the length of v2 tilde is square root of two. Now you understand why I somewhat silly called this point here square root of two half. Um, so okay, uh, uh, we have posed uh, two questions here. How can we get from uh, from v1 to v2? How can we get from v2 uh, to v2 tilde? Uh, let me ask a, a, a third question because the second one is already answered. How can we arrive from v1 at v2 tilde directly? Um, this is as good a point as any to introduce the multiplication of a, first to introduce a matrix, a two by two, and then introduce the multiplication of a matrix with a vector. So a two by two matrix, let's call the, the matrix A, uh, and that's, this is an object that contains four numbers and uh, let me call them A11, A12, A21, and A22. I use this, these indices, the first one, to denote the row, first row, first column, first row, second column, uh, second row, first column, second row, second column. Okay, and then if I have a vector v, which consists of the elements, um, no, let me call the vector, uh, yeah, fine. Uh, I, have, I have already a v1 and a v2 on this, uh, on this sheet, but the, the context should be clear, yeah? So I'm not talking about those two, no, I'm just talking about one vector that has these two entries, v1 and v2. And now I define the, product A times V, matrix times vector, um, which now I can of course write as A11, A12, A21, A22 times V1, V2, but that's not very instructional. Um, I define this as, as a vector. This is going to be an object, an element, R2. Uh, this means that it has two entries. What are the two entries? This is A11 V1 plus A12 V2. And the second entry is A21 V1 plus A22 V2. Okay. If it helps, some people like it, some people don't. You can think of this scheme here, A11, A22, excuse me, A12, A21, A22, V1, V2. And now you multiply the first element in the first row of the matrix with the first element in the vector, A11, V1. Then you add the second element in the first row 
with the second element of the vector 1, A, 1, 2, V, 2. For the second element, you take again the first, for the second element of the second element of the result vector, you take the first element in the second row of the matrix, A to 1, and multiply with the first element in the vector, plus, then you take the second element in the second row, A to 2, and multiply with the second element in the vector, V2. Okay. You can also but what you see here, what you see here is that in order for this operation to go through, you need as many elements in your vector as there are columns in your matrix. You could easily add a third row to your matrix, A31 and A32, and in the same fashion introduce a third element into your result vector, a31, v1, plus a32, v2. Yeah? That's not a problem. A problem is if there is a one row too many or too few, um, excuse me, one column too many or too few in your matrix, or uh, one element too many or too few in your vector. So you need the matrix and the vectors to be of congruent dimension. All right. You can also multiply a row vector. So far, I've always drawn, I've always written the, the vector like a column, but you can also write a vector as a row v1 v2 and multiply this with the matrix a11 a12 a21 a22 in the fashion that we say um, again the result is a row vector of two entries uh, and it is uh, a11 v1 plus a21 v2 and a12 v1 plus a22 v2 again if it helps you you can think of this scheme and again you oops sorry again you multiply a11 v1 plus a21 v2 and then for the second element you do it in the same fashion a12 v1 plus a22 V2. That's the multiplication of a matrix with a vector here and here of a vector. And I'm going to write V transpose, even though we haven't introduced transposition yet, but that's going to come later. Um, but for now, you can only think of, you can just think of the transposition as. Uh, turning the, the the column vector that we have here uh, on its side uh, vector times matrix is the multiplication here. Okay, um, we were coming from the question uh, how can we get from how, how can we find functions uh, that map this, uh, this vector with 1 and 0 here to, um, to the vector v2 or to the vector v2 tilde. Geometrically, if we look at our unit circle here, 
then it is clear that to go from from the vector from the vector now I'm to uh, I'm just going to draw in there and let me do this uh, in, in red to go from the vector one and zero to the vector square root of two half and square root of two half we are rotating the vector by the angle theta yeah. and I'm not just going to throw this at you we're going to build up appreciation for this as we go along I'm going to throw at you that in order to arrive from the vector 1 and 0 at the vector square root of 2 half and square root of 2 half or 1 over square root of 2 1 over square root of 2 what I do is I multiply by the matrix cosine of theta minus sine of theta sine of theta and cosine of theta This is by the rules of matrix multiplication with a vector that we have just discussed. Um, this is cosine of theta times 1 minus sine of theta times 0. So that's 0. Then, for the second entry, I get sine of theta times 1 plus cosine of theta times 0. So I get the vector cosine of theta and sine of theta. And theta is pi quarter. Theta is pi quarter. This is exactly the, the point here. Cosine of theta and sine of theta for my theta equal to pi quarter. And I have, we have already calculated using Pythagoras that the cosine of theta and sine of theta, if theta is pi quarter, is equal to square root of 2 half and square root of 2 half. Uh, so we have already shown it actually that. Uh, that this equality here holds, but of course, if you're so inclined, you can also look it up in the table for the trigonometric functions. But we have actually shown it in the unit circle that this is that this is the case. So I have produced the function that 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 um, carries out this rotation by the angle theta and maps v1 to v2. Yeah. So how do I now get, so, so we have here in our little uh, scheme of questions, this one we could answer right away. Uh, we have now uh, answered this one. Now it just remains to how do we get directly from v1 to v2 tilde? How do we get from here to there? Well, that's easy now, right? Because we just need to combine these two operations. So we know that uh, here we have v1, here we have v2. We know that in order to get from v2 to v2 tilde, we just need to multiply by square root of 2. So we can do this right away. Uh, square root of 2 times the matrix cosine of theta minus sine of theta, sine of theta, cosine of theta, 
uh, times v1 one zero is square root of two times cosine of theta, which is p quarter. I'm writing it out, and sine of p quarter is square root of two times square root of two half square root of two half is one one. There we go. We have arrived from v1 at v2 tilde. In general, I can call this scalar square root of 2 here r, and then I can use my rotation matrix for any angle theta. And any vector x to arrive at a vector y. And this is going to be a rotation of the original vector x by theta. And second, an extension or shrinkage of of the vector of the rotated vector x but I don't want to introduce an extra symbol for that uh, so I just say by the factor r and of course shrinkage if r is less than 1 an extension of r is larger than 1 Geometrically, you can now imagine that given, given any initial vector, and we might as well start with the vector zero, uh, 1 and 0 uh, with our vector v1, that by, by rotating, let's say, say I want to get any arbitrary given point in R2, let's say this one here, all I need to find is the right angle. Different angle, of course. Let's call it psi. Why well, make it difficult? Let's call it alpha. <laughs> um, well, it's also not terribly good now. Well, it wasn't very accurate in the in aiming at the given point, and I don't want to move the point because that would kind of defeat the purpose. So, alpha, and by extension, I need to find the right r. I can target any given point, so I can, in other words, map uh, from the vector 1 and 0 to any other point in, in r2. So we've seen quite a powerful way to go from any given vector in R2 to any other given vector by multiplication with a matrix and a scalar. Okay, maybe it is instructive to think about the rotation in the other direction. So let's say that we that we start with the vector uh, v2 it's tilde. So we we start at this point here, one, one and one, and now we want to rotate in the negative direction. Um, then of course. Um, the angle would be the same, right? This is still theta, but we are going in the in the negative direction, so it's minus theta. Okay. 
So uh, we begin with the with the vector one and one. And I'm doing this also because you may still think well something like a trick was happening here because here the the second entry here was zero, right? And so for some reason something always vanished in this in this matrix multiplication. Now if we start from the from the vector one one, then of course this is not going to vanish. And so I hope this is giving a bit of a uh, of an intuition that um, things actually also uh, work when there's not a zero entry in the, in the initial vector. So now um, we are going in the negative direction. And this means that we're applying the, whoops, we're applying the transformation cosine of minus theta minus sine of minus theta sine of minus theta cosine of minus theta. Now the cosine is an even function which means that the cosine of minus theta is the same as the cosine of theta. The sine is an odd function which means that the sine of minus theta is minus the sine of theta. And so minus sine of minus theta, therefore, is, um, is sine of theta. Plus sine of plus theta, if you will. Sine of minus theta is minus sine of theta. And cosine of minus theta, again, is cosine of theta. And this is by the rules of uh, multiplication of a matrix with a vector cosine of theta plus yeah, cosine of theta times 1 plus sine of theta times 1. Cosine of theta plus sine of theta. And for the second entry we get minus sine of theta times 1 plus cosine of theta times 1. Minus sine of theta times 1 plus cosine of theta times 1. Now, this was however the cosine of pi quarter plus the sine pi quarter, which we have already found out is, so this is minus the sine of pi quarter plus the cosine of pi quarter, and we know that this is square root of 2 half plus square root of 2 half, or 2 times square root of 2, and this is minus square root of 2 half plus square root of 2 half, and so this is the square root of 2 and 0. Let's check this in the picture. I want it to go from V2 tilde by a rotation in the negative direction by the angle theta to the vector that is given and this is, of course, if you wish, v1 tilde, which is certainly given just as uh, just as uh, v2 tilde is given. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, v1 tilde, uh, which is just as uh, uh, just as we have the uh, the vector. Um, 0 and square root of 2 here. In this direction we have the, the vector square root of 2 and 0. And so we see that also geometrically uh, this makes perfect sense.
Okay, so in general, uh, we have this, we have now learned um, that we can go from any given vector in R2 to any other given vector in R2 by uh, rotation and uh, an extension or a stretching of the vector or a shrinking of the vector. Um, I should just be uh, just for the for the sake of completeness here, um, I should say that that theta of course now is given in radians, so it is uh, a number between minus two pi and plus two pi, uh, and r can be can be any number, any real number. This motivates our definition of a vector space. A vector space is a space like this Cartesian product here, uh, R2, x-axis and y-axis, as you know it from high school, in which we can do all these operations and they behave in the way that we expect. So we define an R vector space, which is a vector space where the vectors that we, uh, uh, that we write down all have entries um, that are real numbers. This is a set, let's call it V for vector space such that if we pick three elements, let's call them u, v, and w in the space, and two real numbers, let's call them r and s, we have all the common rules of computation, so I'm writing the following is true. If I add two elements, say u and v, u and w plus w, it doesn't matter. If I add two given elements of the vector space, the sum is still in the vector space. Yeah? This is what we did in the two and three dimensions in the, on the first two sheets. Second, if I multiply a given vector u with a scalar r, I'm extending or I'm, I'm shrinking, I still remain in the vector space. The zero vector is contained in the vector space. So if I'm in two dimensions, this is the vector that has the two entries zero and zero, or if I'm in three dimensions, this is the vector that has the entries zero, zero, and zero. The zero vector is defined such that zero plus any vector in the vector space is equal to that vector. Four. For all vectors in the vector space, there's an element that is called minus v in the vector space such that the sum of v and this element is the zero vector. Five, for the real number one, one in R, we have one times v is equal to v for all vectors in the vector space. And finally, I have my three common rules how addition and multiplication um, cooperate. So I have associativity of addition. This means that if I first add u and v and then I add w, this is the same as first adding v and w 
and then adding u. In multiplication, if I first look at the product s times v, s again is a, is a scalar, just a number, and v is a vector, um, this is the same as uh, first forming the product of the two real numbers r and s, and then multiplying the vector with this product. I have commutativity of addition, so u plus v is the same as v plus u. Remember that was the picture of the parallelogram. And I have distributivity, distributivity, which says that if I look at the sum of the two numbers r and s, and then the product of the sum with the vector r, this is the same as the sum of the product of r with v and the product of s with v. And if I look at the product of the number r with the sum of u and v, this is the same as the sum of the uh, products of the number r with the vector u and the number r with the vector v. Yeah. So if you just look at the definition, it looks like a, a, a like a collection of, of fairly abstract but still kind of intuitive and not surprising rules. What this is trying to conceptualize are exactly these kind of Cartesian uh, coordinate systems that we have drawn and then those uh, vector op and, and matrix operations, uh, so, so far only vector operations, excuse me, um, that we have uh, uh, that we have visualized in these spaces. Let's go back to our three-dimensional space and uh, draw our, our three vectors here, v1, v2, and v1 plus v2. v1 was, was 1, 2, and 3. One, two, no, three units up. One unit is three lines on my ruler here. And I need to go three units up. One, two, three. This is v1. v2 was 3, 1, and 2. One, and now two units up. V2. V1 plus V2 therefore was V4, 3, and 5. So 4, 3, no, 5 units up. V2 
that's v1 plus v2. Now I can of course also consider minus v1, minus v2, and minus v1 minus v2. What do those look like? Minus v1 is minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. Minus 1, minus 2 in the y direction and minus 3 in the z direction. 1, 2, 3, oops, that's minus here. Minus v1. Minus v2 is minus 3, minus 1, and minus 2. Minus 3 minus 1 and minus 3. 1, 2, 3. Minus three, minus one, minus two, and minus three. One, two, three. minus v1 plus v2 in parentheses, or minus v1 minus v2, is uh, is minus 4, minus 3, minus 5. Minus 4, minus 3, 1, Three and minus five. One, two, three, four, five. We now look at the picture that arises. Oh, we also had um, we also had the the difference v two minus v one. Remember, which was two minus one and minus one. Two. Minus one and minus one. This is V one minus V two. Then of course I can also consider minus V two minus V one, which would be minus v2 
plus v1, which is minus 2 plus 1 and plus 1. Minus 2 plus 1 and plus 1, which is, of course, the mirror image to the vector I just drew. This is v2 minus v1. If I now kind of zoom out and erase all the little messes that I made, And you see a you see a big picture emerging, and that is that you can try to try to think three dimensionally. You can you can see that let's let's uh, let's draw these um, let's draw these parallelograms we talked about earlier. You see that we have a we have a plane here inside inside the two dimensional space. This is called a hyperplane. It's a two-dimensional subspace inside a three-dimensional embedding space. And this motivates what we call the linear span. The linear span Let's call it L of V1 and V2. These are our two vectors here, V1 and V2. This is the set of all what's called linear combinations, R times R being a number, times V1, V1 being a vector, plus S times V2, V2 being a vector, S being a number. So I note that here, R and S are numbers. These are all linear combinations. All linear combinations. Intuitively, geometrically, I can say right away, I am a three-dimensional space, and the resulting object that I'm looking at is linear span. Yeah? So, so, so what are the what are the linear combinations here? Here, I'm looking at 1 times v1 plus 1 times v2. Yeah? That's clearly r times v1 plus s times v2. Here, I'm looking at 1 times, oh, let's start with v1 again. Uh, so I'm looking at minus 1 times v1 plus 1 times v2. This is clearly r times v1 plus s times v2. Here I'm looking at 1 times v1 minus 1 times v2. Clearly a linear combination. Here I look, I'm looking at minus 1 times v1 minus 1 times v2. Intuitively, this geometric object clearly has two dimensions and is embedded a hyperplane inside the larger space. So I can write that the dimension of this linear span is two. Two-dimensional subspace of R3, which is our larger Cartesian system. We needed two vectors, V1 and V2, to span this two-dimensional subspace. And these two vectors, V1 and V2, are 
what is called linearly independent. What does this mean? This means intuitively each of them, each uh, of v1 and v2, span a dimension in R3. Yeah, so geometrically this means V1 and V2, or V2 and V1, point in different directions. They span a new direction, a new dimension, so that if I then look at the linear span of the two, I'm looking at a, pl at a, at a, at a plane inside the three-dimensional space. In contradistinction, now I introduced, did I use the, the symbol V3? No, I didn't. Okay, so I can use it here. I define V3 as 2 times V1. 2 times V1, this would be 2, 4, and 6. 2, 4, and 6, let's quickly draw this. Two. Four, six. It's going to be a bit challenging. I'm maybe out of the picture. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. No, I'm lucky. I'm not. Let me see what's happening. So of course, just an extension stretch of the vector v1 up to the accuracy of my drawing. 2 times v1. This would be v3. This does not span an additional direction. It is not spanning a new dimension. It is just an extension of the dimension that is already spanned by, by v1. So there's nothing new here geometrically. So in contradistinction, 2 times v, v1 um, does not span a new dimension. So I can write that the linear span of v1 and v3, even though these are two vectors, is dimension of the linear span of v1 and v3. Even though these are two vectors, the dimension is just one. Because, again, v3 doesn't add a new direction. It's still just a line. It's a line in three-dimensional uh, three space, so the dimension is one. I can write v1 minus 1 half v3. And since v3 is 2 times v1, this is v1 minus 1 half times 2 v1. This obviously is 0, but this is the 0 vector, so it's 0, 0, 0. Um, because v3 is just a multiple of v1. Now, we say that the set of vectors. Now I do it generally, not just in v, v uh, not just in R three, but uh, in general dimensions. Let's call them n. A set of vectors from v one through v n is linearly independent. 
linearly independent. If it's a zero vector does not have a representation as a linear combination, of the set. In other words, R1 times V1, where R1 is a number, plus R2 times V2, where R2 is a number, plus dot dot dot, plus Rn times Vn, where Rn is a number, is not equal to zero when at least one Ri for those n r i uh, is not equal to one. Hmm. Maybe it's what is intuitive is always a bit subjective. Maybe it is more intuitive the other way around. If the vectors v one through v n are linearly independent. And the linear combination R1 V1 plus R2 V2 plus dot 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 plus R and V N is equal to zero, then it must be that all R I are equal to zero. No? This is linear independence and therefore linear dependence of vectors. Now going back to our drawing here. Those two linearly independent vectors v1 and v2 they form what is called a basis of this hyperplane because I can express every vector on this hyperplane as a linear combination of these two vectors. They're not the only basis. I could also pick minus v1 and minus v2, or I could pick minus v1 and v1 minus v2 as basis vectors, but I have now picked v1 and v2, so they are a perfectly good basis. Yeah. So v1 and v2 form a basis of this hyperplane, a two-dimensional subspace of R3. And then I can talk about the standard basis. I just pick three specific vectors. The vectors E1, 1, 0, 0, E2, 0, 1, 0, and E3, 0, 0, 1 are called standard, the standard basis or standard basis vectors, sometimes also called unit vectors, but that's not quite precise for reasons we're going to appreciate later. Standard basis vectors. Why? Because any vector v that has the entries x, y, and z in R3 has a standard representation as a linear combination of 
of the standard basis vectors. And I can read it directly, right? It's completely completely obvious. V is x times 1, 0, 0 plus y times 0, 1, 0 plus z times 0, 0, 1 or x times e1, e1 plus y times e2 plus z times e3. So I can read the linear combination that gives me the representation as a linear combination of the uh, of the standard basis directly from the from the entries in the vector. Similarly, e1 equal to one and zero and e2 equal to 0, 1 as the standard basis of R2. Yeah. And if I have a vector v, x, and y, then this is certainly x times e1 plus y times e2. So now we have all the time talked about Cartesian products and two-dimensional spaces and three-dimensional spaces and in talking about this dimension, two-dimensional subspace of three-dimension bedding space, and talking about this dimension, I've always appealed to your geometric intuition. It's clear what I'm drawing here, right? Uh, but we can now we can now formalize this. And that's the last thing I do in this video. What's the dimension? dimension of a vector space or a subspace. This is the number of basis vectors. that are necessary to span that space. Intuitively, the number of directions, right? Good. That was plenty for one day. So thanks for watching.